Greetings adventurous travelers and fellow keepers of the lake. Welcome to another video on a channel that's based around all things creative, uh, mostly tabletop RPGs, but also I want to expand and talk about anything that results around creative thinking. So the idea here is that we are all keepers of the lake of creative thinking and why it is a lake it's because of the boundaries. Bounded creativity is the best type of creativity. You have the ocean of creative thinking, but the lake is where it's at. So this video is about our experience with the game Crown and Skull. If you're following the channel, you know that I've been focusing on breaking down rules and getting everyone to jump in the game as fast as possible without like any shenanigans. Anyways, uh, this is the setup. I had three players, they're all in the hobby for quite some time and I have pitched this game to them as something that's totally different. It's, it is a sword and sorcery hack and slash type of game, but it's also very unforgiving and uh, sometimes hard, it makes the player feel weak at the beginning. And I didn't really do the whole uh, how to teach the game section of the book and they created characters with like no knowledge of the game, which is fine. I, I really encourage people to make characters without really like trying to min max at the beginning at least. And as these were their first characters, like uh, two of them were like slightly on the spellcaster side and one of the players just put all his points into a weapon that is like uh, super deadly. Of course, taking into account the attrition system, you know that weapon can be lost and at that point, like the strength of that character really falls down quite a lot. Right, so uh, it starts like this. That uh, powerful character, he was working in the mines, uh, the city that we started in is from the book, it's called Rivergate, and it's like a big port on the river, and next to it it's, uh, there is a mountain called uh, Stormkeeper Mountain, and on that mountain I said that there are some mines. This player, he was already doing some errands for the royal family, so the hook in this particular dungeon is that you're escorting the niece of the ruler to the asylum that is in these mountains uh, because she has gone mad. Uh, turns out that, and spoiler alert, uh, I will talk about a bunch of things from this dungeon, so please, if you're a player and you want your DM to run this for you, just forward the video to them and yeah, stop watching here. This player that is working for the royal family and the mines, he got the assignment, a super secret assignment uh, to do this escort without telling other players who it is that they are exporting. He ended up recruiting the other two players and they went on to the journey. Also, I had a couple of um, like hirelings that were following them that are also workers in the mine. I tried introducing some of the combat inside the, the town just to get a feel for the combat and then after that have a little bit of downtime to talk about how the combat went. But unfortunately they, or fortunately for them, they found a way to bypass this combat and they went straight into the adventure. So the first encounter that they had is from the book and it is a couple of road rats that are attacking them in the mountains. And it served the purpose well, they tried it out, they saw how combat functions. On the location the story goes as follows, they go into the asylum, they check in the, the niece, they start getting a letter from the, the keeper of the asylum or whatever you call it, and then an avalanche happens and it totally like destroys everything in the castle. So they have to traverse the castle, go on to the lower levels and go all the way down the mountain to the grottoes where they like leave. The design of the dungeon is mapless, which is something that this game introduces. And I decided to have a dedicated navigator player with, and that player rolled um, some dice. And these two dice are uh, basically representing the location inside the level of the dungeon and what event or discovery or something they encounter. So if they roll a four on the first die, they are basically at the exit and then they resolve the event and they can proceed to the next level. In the first couple of levels, they are really lucky. They roll like a four, four and in the next level four, four. So they had only two little uh, encounters on those two levels. But on the lower levels, they spent a little bit more time there. And how this function is, is as you can see uh, here, if you go back to the same place, you're interpreting that as them being lost. 
which means that if the player that is the navigator has some navigation skills, I would make it easier to roll four. Basically, I would give like a plus to the first d4. Yeah, first couple of combats, pretty standard. Uh, the two spellcasting characters, they got really scared that they're gonna die. But the, the player that put all his points into his weapon, he was just slashing through everything. And they killed Nice, they killed everyone, and and the thing is, this asylum is not really an asylum, it's like where ancient werewolves uh, recruit new people, it's like a werewolf sanctuary, basically. So the niece was there because of her murderous tendencies, and their idea was to recruit her. So one of the encounters was with the niece, and they just slaughtered her, and they slaughtered everything. But as the resources started to be depleted and they couldn't rest because they, there was constant danger of an avalanche or anything that was like living in the walls and the cells beneath the asylum, some of them got broken. So the enemies, uh, the monsters and the, um, the prisoners started escaping. Uh, they started to be more and more concerned. And first thing I noticed uh, here is that the combat runs very fast when you go into the flow of just calling out phases turns go like amazingly fast and also for me as a dm even for stronger monsters having the tactics and rolling for them made even like combats with multiple enemies very easy for me to run like i ask do, do the enemies want to engage if they're already engaged i roll the dice and just see what they do. And they roll the dice like all at once. If I have three enemies, I roll three dice at once, see what each of them is doing. Maybe I decide to like change which of these dice uh, corresponds to which monster. Um, I did that maybe once just to make it a bit more spicy. But other than that, I just roll the die for each monster one by one. and Or I just color code them and see what the resolve is. Also, uh, what I've noticed is if they are uh, already experienced role players, they won't have that much of a problem with attrition and like describing which part of them got hurt. Most of the social skills that they decide to cross off, they explained as getting a hit to the head. You as a DM could spice this up. For example, they had a skill that allows you to like persuade uh, nobles more easily. And I described it as like getting hit by the enemy which caused you to be like angry at the royal family because you're doing this for them in a way. So now if you were to meet uh, someone from the royal family, you would be pissed at them and you wouldn't be like good at persuasion. This in turn snowballed into like them just straight out annihilating the niece uh, because she's part of the royal family and my player was like, yeah, I lost the skill, that's fine, but I'm also very angry at like the whole royal family, so I'm just not gonna try to save her and just like... And yeah, they uh, found the, the NPC that is in the book, the, the frogkin uh, that was arrested and put into this asylum. I tried to get like them to RP with him, maybe have him as a future quest hook or something. And that didn't really work. They were just like to hell with this guy. If we save him, he might even like betray us. So we're low on resources. We don't want to be bothered with him, which is unfortunate. But hey, that's how role playing games go. They continued. They went deep where the butcher is. They somehow like never met the butcher. They had very lucky die rolls. So combat was just enough for us. For example, if you have bad die rolls, you would end up having a lot of combat encounters. And in my opinion, it is better to have less than more. I mean, you don't want to have like five uh, rolls of the navigator dice uh, be combat. There is a tip from House DM that I heard, which is like try to prolong combat as much as possible. So maybe uh, the butcher starts threatening them and they find a way to like convince him that they will bring him more people to convert into werewolves if he lets them go or something. Try to evade getting into combat as much as possible until like combat is eminent. The other thing that I would mention here is that sometimes I felt like I have depleted for a certain level everything that's in the book. So what I would consider doing is uh, prepping some of the narrative nuggets. If you don't know what narrative nuggets in uh, this channel's lore uh, are, 
Uh, that's actually the second video I released. I will put the link in the description and <laughs> it's a very low quality video. I'm still getting a hang of all this, but like, yeah, the things that I'm talking about, I still think they make sense. Just the production is horrible. But yeah, check it out. I mean, um, grab some of these nuggets, have them on the side and make them like something that can be used on any floor. So you're set. Also prep some that are in the forests around the asylum because the players will eventually go out and as they are traveling to the asylum maybe you want to incorporate some of those. So at this point we were very uh, like used to the attrition system, the, the, the combat, the persuasion and social skills and everything. The only thing that had some form of friction in, in our game was how the loot works. And you have to be very careful with loot because if you give them something that they can put in their inventory, that's basically healing them. Now, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the scenario where they went to the, the level that's one above the end of the dungeon and there they saw the keeper of the asylum and he was in the middle of transformation to the werewolf. So now you introduce timers. Oh, I had a certain timer that was... Um, like ticking each round and when it ticks to, to one, the transformation of the werewolf is, is complete and he gains a lot of hit points, he becomes very powerful. But before that happens, he has, I think, around three uh, hit points in the book. You can basically kill him in one blow. I described him as having two daggers and very long arms and he was just like stabbing people with those two daggers. And when he died, they tried to take those daggers from him. At that point, I said, yeah, you can take them. Uh, I was not sure. I, I was thinking about that a lot. In a way, it is healing them, but... Also, my spellcasting characters were so weak that it wasn't really fair. I know that the name of the game here is not fair. It's narrative, it's like feeling like you're in danger, but I think taking daggers in this uh, scenario is fine. Like you would sprinkle some potions of cure light wounds in D&D in these sorts of places, especially like if they pass through almost the whole dungeon and defeated a boss in, in a sense. So even if he had small amounts of HP, they still managed to get to, to that point in the game. So taking those daggers, I saw it as like, okay, you, you got some healing out of it. Stacking with the taking a breather, that's also fine in my opinion in, in this case but I can't stop thinking about the situation okay I gave them uh, the daggers this time what will happen if they start taking the weapons of each enemy well at some point they will run out of inventory space and they will just have a bunch of weapons on them so how I would combat this I would tell them like do it if it makes narrative sense if your character would actually use the weapon or like describe using it as some sort of improvised armor. I wouldn't use it as only something that attrition damages, but I would also buff the defense by one. But I would maybe say that this item would be discarded um, more easily, like have a priority to be discarded. I don't know. Uh, I'm still thinking about uh, the ways to handle this. And yeah, they jumped into the hole, they were in the grottoes, they managed to get to the big crab, they evaded the big crab and went out of the cave. And then they were, because they jumped into the hole and fell into some water, they were wet and it was snowing outside so they were freezing. They decided to come back and try to take the crab. I was sure that the crab will kill them. It has like the third tactic uh, is almost like an insta-kill uh, if you don't manage to to release yourself from its grip. They managed to, to like outsmart the crab. They started like improvising some fire weapons and like did some damage over time. And I ruled it a bit uh, most on instinct, like how much damage it would deal. But it made sense. Like they were really uh, like putting everything they have into the crab. The characters that were uh, weaker, they started like tanking the hits so that the, the guy that has the best weapon could just like slam the crab as much as possible. And they found a way to, to defeat the crab, which was intense. It was amazing. And at that point, they got the idea uh, about how everything functions. And I considered killing the crab as a mighty deed. So the player that dealt mo most damage to the crab, I awarded a couple of 
I think two or three points to him extra. After the game, I thought that this wasn't maybe the best course of action. Maybe I should have uh, awarded three points to all of them. A point per person, that makes maybe more sense to me now. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's how it went. And it actually took us around four hours to complete the dungeon and to complete uh, like the prologue. I usually do prologues as like 10 minutes per person and then I find a way to like connect all of their stories so that they meet and, and start doing things together. And also I prepared a couple of hexes, those are zines from uh, Runehammer um, Patreon. One of them is in the neighborhood of the mountain, the other is far away in the world but I just moved it also there and gave some quest hooks. So they had a couple of things to do on their way home and that's where we ended the session. All in all, I would say that I can certainly see this system being something that I would like to play a lot, that I would maybe play for longer periods of time like I did Pathfinder, but like Pathfinder is very, very like numbery and those enemy stat blocks look like, um, well, Excel spreadsheets. So having stat blocks that are this small and manageable, it really emphasizes that the DM should focus his attention in like the, the, the emergent story and the whole mapless dungeon thing really emphasizes the emergent story. And also if you start playing, I, I almost forgot, if you start playing and you don't really know where they're gonna go, there is an incredible hex scroll system here. Uh, what I did is I printed out a couple of um, pages from the book onto little uh, index cards, uh, like the locations for hex scrolling. So in case they went outside of the, the zone, I would have something to throw at them that is canonical to the world. So for the prep, I'm all against having any technology at the table. I know a no shade to people that use technology at the table. I only use my soundboard first video I ever made. It's a crappy video, but the tech is good. Uh, check it out. It will also be in the description. So I only use my soundboard. There is no laptops on the table. If you play like that, print out the dungeon. If you're running Rivergate, for example, uh, take a couple of uh, things from the book about Rivergate, like the prompts. They are, I think, in the DM part of the book. And you have like a simple description of Rivergate at the beginning of the book in the player guide. Uh, Take both of those, print them out, print out some pictures of Rivergate to hand out to players, uh, print out some of the hex locations that are around that zone. You might see that northwest, yeah, northwest part right next to Rivergate, it isn't uh, represented in the hex locations. Just take the Brinewood one or something like that and fill it in. All in all, I think that's it. The, the stat blocks are already inside of the dungeon material, so I wouldn't really do the cards for them. But if you want, you can just like write it out. It, it's like three sentences per NPC. Print out the map. And of course, if you have your laptop while you're playing, you can just keep all of this printing and still print out the map. But everything else you can like um, just use from the computer. Whew. I am still looking forward to playing more of Crown and Skull uh, and I really think like the, the magic system is something that you need to go deep into. I still haven't incorporated uh, the Crown and the Skull uh, NPCs, the rings and everything. Consider doing that, maybe you write it down as one of the nuggets. Maybe someone from the Asylum has the ring and they find it and they can't really like put it on. If they put it on someone would know, for example, that they are not high enough level to be of one of those orders so they might be attacked for that and the ring could be confiscated maybe that's also one of the hooks that you can have at the end of this scenario i know i don't have really a, a perfect structure for explaining this and i'm omitting a lot of the lore stuff and i know that's where the meat is at but all the lore is in the book and i really 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 want to avoid like spoiling anything that's in the book I want to focus on the mechanics in the whole playlist, so yeah, the the buying stuff part of the game, like how do you roleplay buying things? Because my players, they come from Pathfinder and they really like the, the roleplaying part of buying stuff and like bargaining. And if you have uh, a couple of players that and that are all into it, you kind of have to do it, you know? And it was very hard for them to conceive that how much am I getting paid for this job? How much money does this um, 
trap cost. And I said like, okay, the job you're doing for the royal family, you will be paid enough. Imagine you're getting a value you're happy with. Not something that will make you super rich, but something that will certainly make you happy. And they were like, well, but in, for example, Call of Cthulhu, you have the credit rating and that would be boosted. Well, no, here, when you complete the quest and you get the money, that, that money is actually the reward of three or more hero points that you're getting. In the long run, I can see why this system is beneficial. Like, it really saves time, it streamlines the boring part of the game where there is no action. But at the same time, there is a certain addiction to collecting stuff, hoarding treasures. Of course, it's not all hero points. You can find an item that's like legendary and have it as your little uh, treasure. And that's the whole point. To emphasize the important items. Everything else is considered broken and unusable. But it doesn't really work for everyone. And I would certainly try to homebrew like maybe some form of like a hybrid system for this. Uh, I don't know. I wholeheartedly recommend not homebrewing anything in the first couple of sessions because you want to get the feel for the game and your biases will make you recreate D&D from Crown and Skull. And that is totally not the point here. Another thing uh, related to loot and treasure is you have the tables in the book that specify how much ordinary items cost in the game. And if you can sell those items for points, that means that you can kind of sell three bear traps to acquire a spell. Now, you need to have a wizard that is willing to, for example, teach you a spell or find a spell in the book, or you have to create a narrative of how you manage to get that spell. And in terms of roleplay, that is fine, but in terms of like mechanics, people are then hoarding bear traps to get pretty powerful spells. That kind of unbalance is fixed by just common sense, but not everyone is a dedicated role player. Not everyone does this just for role playing. People do this for the tactics and action as well. So especially people coming from tactical games. Uh, so they might try to like make a bear trap hoarding economy for buying spells. Just talk to people, tell them that this is not possible or at least um, make some form of like a multiplier. Okay, you can uh, use 10 bear traps to find a spell if you find a wizard that is willing to teach you a spell for a amount of money that's worth, for example, 10 bear traps. I don't know, but still, uh, it will require some tweaking of the mental view on these sorts of things and in our game and how I run this stuff we can always make a deal like whenever we are not sure what to do we don't look at the rules and try to find like uh, an order how this is done like the procedure we just make a deal like we bargain that's the whole point I, I talked about bargaining with DM in a bunch of different videos and this is it like this game requires you to bargain with the DM, requires you to be a bit more open to the discussion, like, okay, people, how are we handling this? And I think with the following volumes of the book, and this is just like the, the first volume, so with the following volumes of the book, we will certainly get uh, even those things refined. If you have like questions, something that I missed or like forgot to say, just write in the comment and I will make a follow-up video, I will respond to the comment, like, as soon as I see it, and I trust me, I will see it as I have one comment per video still. So yeah, I I'm, I I see you people, and don't be afraid. Come sit on down and and let's discuss beautiful roleplay uh, stuff. And I'm also thinking of doing like just a rambling video where I will sit down and just like talk to the camera and imagine like my friend is there and just talk about a bunch of different stuff because I'm running out of ideas for videos that could be done fast. Most of the video ideas I have are like pretty complex to, to make. After these videos, there won't be Crown and Skull videos for some time because we're uh, kind of jumping into the Two-Headed Serpent Pulp Cthulhu campaign. So expect something from there. We've also played a bit of uh, Cult. It's not for everyone. And um, probably won't be running Cult for, for some time now. I have some ideas for my own scenarios for Cult, and I might be writing those and, and releasing them on Ko-Fi or Patreon or something like that, but that has a long way to go still, so 
Expect some Cthulhu content and probably Pathfinder content and as always my mechanical ideas, breakdowns and that sort of thing. And yeah, uh, let's end this ramble. Uh, I hope this video was useful to you and as always keep on going, keep on loving, keep on being creative, play more D&D and I will see you in the next one. Farewell Keepers.